The nervous system, along with its partner, the endocrine or hormone system, provides most of the sensory and control systems for the body. It allows us to communicate with the outside and the different parts of our body to communicate with each other. When we sense a change, whether inside or outside our bodies, we respond in a controlled and ordered way. This is known as coordination. So how does the body respond to its environment? How does it deal with change? Thank you. Well, the nervous system uses sense organs and cells called receptors to detect changes in the environment. It then stimulates other organs and cells, such as muscles, called the effectors, to bring about a response or action. It's also the network of communicating nerve cells that coordinates these activities. These complex systems influence everything we do and are the subject of this episode of The Virtual Body. All our body functions require the use of the nervous system. How complicated are the sensory and nervous responses, do you think? that allow our two teams of footballers to simply play the game. They are demonstrating and using a whole variety of coordination and sensory skills. Our nervous system appears extremely complicated in structure, but the basic building block, the neuron, is similar in all vertebrates. Our nervous responses usually fall into two groups those that happen automatically without conscious control and those that involve the higher thinking centres of the brain, conscious decision-making. Here, we see a player being fouled. He's pushed over and kicked on his leg. His body sets off a reflex action as the kick is detected by receptors in his shin, a pain receptor that transmits messages through the nervous system. A reaction or reflex is instantly produced and the leg is pulled away from the stimulus. This reflex action takes only a fraction of a second to initiate and doesn't require conscious thought or processing by the brain. The human nervous system is made up of two sections. Firstly, the brain and spinal cord together form the central nervous system and this forms the main control centre for operations. The central nervous system connects to all other parts of the body by the extended branches or nerves of the peripheral system. The peripheral system is the second section of our two nervous systems, the part that reaches out to all the body's cells from the tip of your little toe to the end of your nose. Sometimes the nervous system is likened to a computer, but in fact it's much more sophisticated than any computer we've been able to produce. Our footballer produced a reflex action to being kicked. The messages that brought about this action travelled through the nervous system by a route which is referred to as a reflex arc. The arc starts at a receptor and finishes at an effector. It can be thought of as a chain with links. The links are nerve cells or neurons. Just below the skin surface are tiny receptors, specialised cells that detect a range of sensations such as heat, cold, a tickle, an itch and of course pain. The footballer was kicked on his leg and the receptors in that area picked up the contact. From the receptor, a message was sent along a sensory neuron via its long extension, the axon, to the connector neuron in the spinal cord. The messages are tiny pulses of electricity, nerve impulses. These nerve impulses are all separate as they travel along the axon one after the other. At the junction between each neuron there's a small gap, the synapse. When the impulse reaches the end of the sensory neuron, it produces a small amount of a chemical substance called a neurotransmitter, which is released into the gap. This activates the connector neuron to produce its own electrical impulse that's carried across the spinal cord. The neurotransmitter is produced on only one side of the gap to ensure that the impulse travels in the right direction, from receptor to effector. The impulses then continue on their journey along the effector neuron. The effector in this case was a muscle which caused the player to pull his leg away. 
This sequence forms a reflex arc. It does not directly involve the brain. The inflamed tissue at the site of the kick on the footballer's leg stimulates more pain receptors. These trigger messages to be sent up the spinal cord to the brain, where they produce the sensation of pain and the cry that was heard. This is the result of higher level activity, which involves different parts of the brain. Now let's examine what exactly the brain is doing here. Basically, the brain makes sure that the right muscles contract at the right time. This is called coordination. All our responses require coordination. The brain processes the information it receives and ensures the right actions take place. However, this ability to coordinate movement is not something we're born with. It's an ability we develop through learning and stimulation and lots of practice. The more a baby moves and falls down, the more circuits are being hardwired into place in the cerebellum, that part of the brain which controls posture and movement. Circuits involved in controlling movement will not be fully formed until around the age of two. Once nerve cells hook up with muscles to complete the circuit, the brain can start to memorise how that particular muscle is used. Then complex actions like walking, sitting down, taking a drink can be performed without thinking. So how difficult is it for the human body just to remain motionless? Well, let's think about the amount of coordination required just to stand still. The cerebellum and cerebral hemispheres together control coordination and movement. If it weren't for constant monitoring by the cerebellum, we would be incapable of even remaining erect. A lot of muscle activity is going on just to keep him in an upright position and to stop him from falling over. So just imagine what level of muscle control and coordination is required when it comes to doing this. Well, that required fantastic coordination. But even a simple action, like touching your nose with your finger, involves the skeleton, muscles and the nervous system. This voluntary action begins as a stimulus in the cerebral hemispheres. Motor neurons, or nerves, then carry impulses to muscles, causing them to contract, pulling the bone in the process. The bone moves at a joint, and a second muscle, called the antagonistic muscle, returns the bone or limb to its original position. So how is the action brought about in the first place? Well, we make sense of our surroundings by using our sense organs and receptors to gather information and relay it to the central nervous system. Sense organs make up the front line of the sensory system. But what are our sensory organs? Eyes, ears, hands, nose and skin, lips and tongue all provide our sensory system with the information it requires to react to our surroundings and stimulations. The brain copes with a phenomenal amount of sensory information and uses it in an appropriate course of action. Some parts of the body contain more receptors than others and so a larger proportion of the brain is devoted to them. This is our virtual body as expressed in pen field mapping. This distorts the body to reflect the proportions of the brain's involvement with our sense organs. As you can see, we have many receptors for taste and for touch, but other areas of the body, such as the torso and legs, have relatively few. But the sensory input from the eyes takes up more of the brain's processing power than the rest of the body put together. The process of seeing is highly complex, and the eye consists of two main parts, the lens and the retina. But seeing can be divided into a definite sequence. As light enters the eye through the pupil, it's focused by the lens on the retina. Here it forms an inverted two-dimensional image. Energy from the light is transduced into an electrical signal, and this nerve impulse is carried to the brain via the optic nerve. 
Because the images we see are complex, containing colour, shape and light intensity information, a large number of brain receptors are required to process this imagery. The visual imagery is constantly changing, and so vision is the most highly developed of all the sensory systems. We are born with almost all the active brain cells we will ever possess, but many of them are not yet connected with each other. During the first year of life, a baby's brain will triple in weight as it rapidly makes new connections between neurons in response to learning and stimulation in its new world. The growth of this neural net in the brain increases exponentially up until puberty. The human ability to learn, remember, think, interpret and organise continues to develop throughout adulthood. You've probably made quite a few new connections while you've been watching this programme. The tripling in brain weight in the first year of a baby's life is a growth rate unique to humans. It has been crucial to the survival of our species. Though if the brain was much bigger at birth, normal delivery would be impossible. One theory for the extinction of the Neanderthals is that their overlarge head interfered with successful childbirth. At least a hundred billion neurons and a thousand billion supporting cells make up the adult human brain. But it's the intricate pattern of connections between these neurons that give the brain an enormous capacity in a relatively small space to sort and process a constant flow of detailed information. In terms of function, the brain can be divided simply into three main areas. Firstly, the medulla oblongata. This is the connection between the brain and the spinal cord, and it controls the automatic responses like respiration, circulation and balance. Secondly, the cerebellum. This controls posture, balance and movement, and muscle activity and coordination. And lastly, the cerebral hemispheres, or cerebrum. This is the site of the higher order functions, such as intelligence, memory, consciousness, thinking and reasoning. It's this bit which makes us more intelligent than other animals, and it makes up 85% of the human brain's weight. You wouldn't get me doing that. No way. Three, two, one, bungee! Why are some people quite happy to chuck themselves into thin air on the end of an elastic band? Why do some people get a thrill from doing this? And how did she overcome her fear of jumping? It all hinges on the links between the nervous and endocrine systems. Well, her emotions, physical sensations and reactions were all caused by a chemical released by her endocrine system. The endocrine system is another sensory system or communication highway for messages. But this time, the messages are sent by chemicals called hormones. Hormones are secreted by endocrine glands into the bloodstream where they're taken to specific areas of the body to produce a specific response. A burst of energy was required to attempt the bungee jump and this comes from the release of the emergency hormone adrenaline. Secreted by the adrenal glands on the top of the kidneys, adrenaline passes into the bloodstream and almost instantly, body cells respond by metabolising faster, thus generating more energy. Adrenaline is partly behind that sinking feeling you get before an exam. The heart begins to pound as it beats more quickly and blood is diverted to the muscles and the brain away from the other organs. The body is prepared for quick action. Adrenaline acts very quickly. Most hormones act much slower and bring about long-term change. So how are hormones controlled? Well, through a coordinating centre called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is located in the brain and it's a link between the nervous and endocrine systems. 
our bungee jumper whoops with delight when she's done the jump. Where does this pleasure emanate from? Does she feel it only in her brain? Is the rest of her body reacting to the event at all? Is the pleasure the result of a hormonal or a nervous reaction? Well, the answer is both. We feel pleasure as a result of the release of chemical messengers in the brain called endorphins. The endorphins affect the pleasure centres in the cerebral hemisphere of the brain. The cerebral hemispheres carry out higher mental activities that give us our feelings, our emotions, our personalities and the ability to think and reason. All these higher functions are the result of some physiological processes occurring in the brain. And substances that interfere with the biochemistry of the brain also therefore interfere with the way we feel and behave. So what substances do this? Some drugs interfere with neurotransmitters in the brain and central nervous system. Drugs such as alcohol suppress brain activity. Stimulants speed it up. Misuse of drugs can therefore have extremely dangerous side effects. Repeated use can lead to addiction. The body becomes tolerant to the drug so that it can no longer function without it. Heroin is highly addictive, as is alcohol and the nicotine in cigarettes. They all produce physiological changes in the brain. A physiological dependency to the drug develops and efforts to stop will cause painful withdrawal symptoms. As well as their effects on our mood and behaviour, these drugs are poisons and can kill brain cells. Whilst the highs of a drug are short-lived, its side effects can be long-term and debilitating. Ecstasy is one such drug, where repeated use can lead to serious mental health problems in later life. Thankfully, taken under the care of a doctor at the advised dosage, other drugs, like antibiotics and painkillers, are very helpful when we're ill. Certain types of food can also alter the way we feel. Coffee and tea contain a mild stimulant called caffeine, which makes us feel more alert. Ooh, and chocolate, thank you. Now, nothing makes me happier than to sit back, relax, put on some of my favourite music and eat masses of chocolate. Mm. Chocolate is another great chemical messenger. It's something that I know makes me really feel good and fortunately it's relatively harmless to indulge in now and again. But I suspect that virtual body couldn't even begin to understand what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, virtual body is still happier with the more basic pleasures in life. A developed being, a more advanced intelligence. I'm afraid he's not quite made it there yet. <laughs>